Tom Peters famously said, under promise and over deliver. That's today's topic, which happens to be epiphany number 23 for myself. And perhaps you can get some use out of this. And let me continue Tom Peters' quote about that. He says, quality is important to be sure, so is absolute response time and of course price. But at the top of most lists by far for customers is keeping your word. And in fact, I'll go so far to say that what I found, and I think it's more true today than ever was before, it's not even so much under promise over deliver. Most or, or many people in, in the sales service industry, of course, I'm in the financial services and investment industry, but regardless, just doing the what we used to consider the base normal makes you better. So it's not even just under promise over deliver. It's like just deliver what you promise. Don't even go the extra mile. Just go like go go the mile that you promised you'd go. Like if you just do that, if you're actually on time, you actually call someone back when you said you would, when you sent the email that if if you need to check on something for a client, you actually do it and follow up in in the same time frame you promised, you will be ahead of most people. And I don't, I don't even know if it's like a generational thing. I've, I've, I've seen people my age that are my generation, but just in the modern era, they act like this. It's, it's um, As someone who trains and develops advisors, and I love my guys and my gals, but it's, it's amazing how people don't return phone calls, how they say they're going to do something they don't or they delay it. And I'm telling you, this topic is great, and there's, there's some really easy things I think you can do to stand out. But I, can t I promise you this. If you just do what your mom taught you to do to be a good person and be respectful, you're going to be ahead of most people. Like I said, just be on be on time. Call someone back when you said you're going to call them back, right? Do something you say you're going to do, again, without even going the extra mile. You just do that. So let's get into this a little bit and some of the things you can do. When I first heard this concept, right, without read, reading his books and really diving into it, I thought... It primarily referred to you would over promise on the product. I'm sorry, over deliver on the product. Like, you know, you, you buy a car and then they give you free floor mats that was unexpected. Or maybe even they oh, would the warranty instead of being 36 months will give you an extra half a year. It's, you know, 40, 42 months or whatever. Or, you know, extra coding on it. Well, I know in my business, the financial services business, I, I can't over deliver the product. The product is what it is, what it is. I can't give an extra higher rate of return on the mutual fund than what it does. I can't make it look prettier. I can't even reduce the cost, right? It is what it is. And thankfully, what it for t turned out, as the quote just said, is that what makes you stand out isn't actually th tangible things with the product or even intangible things with the product. It's the intangible things with you, with me. It's us. Right. As Tom says, it's not about response time necessarily. It's not about even quality of the product. Everything's got to be up to par. This is just things that make you stand out. It's not even price. It's it's your behavior. And that was the good news because that's the one thing I could control. Right. It's easy to screw up, but it's also easy to do. And as I mentioned in, the, in a moment ago, in today's era, it is so easy to get ahead. It's just like being in shape. Right. When you're a little bit older, like I'm in my 50s. Like to stand out in terms of being healthy and in shape is a lot easier than it was when I was 25. Because most people my age let themselves go, right? Or or more, or at least more so than before. It's the same thing here. In this modern era, if you follow some of these basic principles, and probably many of you are, you're going to be so far ahead of everybody else because it's it's amazing. It's almost I feel like more people screw it up than get it right, right? So another way to say it is uh, promise PM, deliver AM, um, reliability rather than aggressive promises is the most valuable strategic edge. And this is important. Customers unfailingly prefer slightly less aggressive promises, but ones that are actually honored. Okay. They want predictability. My dad always taught me, you know, when driving, the most important thing in driving your car in terms of, of, you know, being a good citizen on the road is predictability. That's why blinkers and, and not making sudden movements and staying in the lane, you know, all that, being predictable. And that's what your customers want, okay? They don't want necessarily, like, I, I was never the cleverest. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stupid. Um, I, I'm reasonably intelligent. 
And if I put my mind to it, I can learn most everything, just like all of you. But the two things I know, and I look back on my career that I had going for me, that I was really good at, I, I would say like almost, almost an A+, plus, was number one was I was very good at making a complex subject simple. I always felt I would be a good teacher. And I just had a knack for, because that's how I learn stuff, is I is break it down elements. I'd use, I'd use props, you know, a lot of analogies, metaphors, stories. And I felt like I was always good at, at not using jargon and breaking it down for people, keeping things simple, especially something as complicated as investments. And the other one was, I, I felt I was pretty good at what I would call the fundamental human stuff. Not that my people skills were amazing. I would consider myself actually a C grade um, I'm, I'm not, you never walk away from me and go, man, that guy's got amazing people skills. I'd never have, I'm a normal guy. But I, what I was good at was, maybe it's the German in me, was you know being on time, not over-promising. And that's before even like hearing these words, just tell them what you're going to do and do that. In fact, it's funny, I have a, uh, um, my grandmother's neighbor in Germany many years ago, she worked for a very large pharmaceutical company, one that you know and all of you have done business with, it's a German company, and she worked there. And one of the things she complained about, this is interesting. One of the things she complained about was hiring Americans. And I asked her why, and she said, the reason is because they have this thing about always, you, you, when they're interviewing them, or even just, not just hiring a, even an employee, but hiring like a team or, or doing business with a new vendor that's American, is they would, they would always overpromise. And we've even heard that from the flip side of to say, hey, I just I say, yes, I can do it. Then I'll figure it out. Right. And we praise that. And she would say drives us crazy because it turns out that they don't. Or if they do, they got it takes them a longer time to ramp up. So they'd always promise stuff they couldn't do yet with the hoping of getting the, the agreement or the sale or getting the job. And then they try to scramble and learn as much as they can. And what's weird is on this side of the pond, we almost admire that trait. Yeah, I said I can do it. And I'll just figure it out. But the receiving end, which in this story is our customer, they don't want that. So I, I came from that ethic. If I couldn't do something, I say I couldn't do it. If I could, I could. I wouldn't exaggerate. It wasn't even, I wasn't like, it wasn't like a principle I was proud of. It was just the way you were supposed to be. And then, and that was normal. And I realized over time, it took me years. And then when moving to California, I lived on the East Coast for a while. No disrespect to Californians. I love it and I live here. But boy... The level of flakiness and the amount of people that say they're going to do something or show up or return a phone call or show up for an interview or clients and that they blow you off and then they never tell you or if you do see them later and confront them, they blow it off like, oh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't make it. Like, okay, what do you mean you couldn't? Like, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you tell me ahead of time? That The, the, the amount of the, that happening is massively exaggerated from like the East Coast and it happened a lot more there than when I, you know, coming from Germany. This is actually good news. It doesn't matter where you live because it makes it makes you stand out by just being being good, being average, right? So j just delivering on what you promise. But now what can we do? Let me give you some examples here. So what can we do to 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 in a positive way exacerbate that trait of being good? So the main thing again is consistency, accessibility, uh, and just the normal things, like number one is being on time or timing in general, right? That is so hard for people to do. If I had a just, just I had just two days ago, I had a phone call with a potential client. She saw me online. We connected. It was about a living trust. She wanted more information, but she was going on vacation. like two months ago, January sometime. This is this is March. So it was just like a, a message thing, right? It was, I never talked to her on the phone. It's just, she saw like a marketing piece I did and replied to it. I said, sure, I'd love to, you know, talk to you on the phone for a little while. I'm on, going on vacation. So I said, uh, great. You know, she said, call me first week of March. So then what I did was I said, great, a wonderful, do you mind, uh, if you don't mind, I'll pencil in a time now. I'm typing all this, right? This is just by chat back and forth. <laughs> and so I looked at my calendar, got a date and I got a specific date. And it was, um, I guess it was Tuesday or Wednesday of this week at like 3.30. And she goes, yeah, that's fine, no problem. So I put it in my calendar, and guess what I do? I actually call her on that day at 3.30. And not to my surprise, she was surprised. She goes, oh, wow, you actually called me. I'm like, well, yeah, of course, I put it in the calendar. 
You know what kind of credibility you get just from that move? Um, back in the day, I guess I still I shouldn't say back then, even now, but back, back when we were using paper like calendars, you know, little uh, day timers, the day timers. When I was with a client and we had to schedule a follow up or even schedule had to do or they say, ask me, hey, can you check on this account or can you do this is all before computers? Even now, it doesn't matter. I would make a show of it to open my day timer and put in, OK, so we'll meet next Thursday at 730. OK, the Johnsons or John and Melinda, if I was on first name basis, always use a first name. I kind of mumble it out loud and I would make a show of it that they could see I'm putting it in my calendar, not just say, OK, great, I'll see you Thursday. And in the modern era, later on, when I got a Palm Pilot, I would pull my Palm Pilot out and I'd make a show of it, putting it in the calendar. It's not just, it's it's also, it's not just to make a show of it, but it's also to demonstrate you're a professional and that I'm putting it in my calendar and I expect that you are going to be available at that time or you're going to do, you know, if this is something we're doing together or if they ask me to do something, I make a point that they see me write it down. Nowadays, when I'm on the phone, and someone asks me to client, I call a client, talk to them about something, ask me to do something. I will make a, a little demonstration of it, like if it's on a computer or like they can hear me typing. I'm not fake typing. I mean, I'm really putting in my notes and I actually do that to the other side of it too, guys. It's not about, I use the expression, make a show of it, but you actually got to actually do it. So I'm not like, I'm not randomly typing on a keyboard, but I want to make sure I even tell them, hey, can you hold on a second and write this down? Or I'll put it in my calendar right now. I'll put it in my to-do list right now. Like I'll say that. That's what a professional does. And then, of course, the hardest part still easy, but the hardest part is you got to actually do it. You just do those basic things. This is not even over delivering. This is over delivering than I, what I believe to be our current environment. But this is just what we we're supposed to be doing anyway. Right. So anyway, timing is one is beyond. You say you're going to be there three o'clock, be there at three o'clock. You say to be on Thursday, be there on Thursday, on, thir on Thursday, not, not on Friday. I don't think you should be early. Uh, maybe one minute, especially if it's face to face. Phone call. I wait till I I, I literally wait there, and then when it, the clock hits on the phone, I got, I'm ready to dial. I get the little dialer up, and I wait till it turns to you know zero zero seconds, and I call. I don't do it before. I don't do it a minute after. Another tip on on another mistake that I've made a million times, but I think that that we all make, is if you're going to be late, like if you're on a physical, or even if you're on a phone again. Do, you can apply all this stuff, the physical world or virtual world, it doesn't matter. You're driving to an appointment, you're going to be late. Um, you're on the phone with an existing client or something else, and you've got an appointment coming up. You don't want to hang up because you're in the middle of it. Um, so you want, you text the other person or whatever and say you're going to be late. Let me give you a tip. You want to exaggerate how late you're going to be and then not be that late. But what most of us tend to do is we under exaggerate right you're, you're late for the party and you're you're driving and you get you call the person or your doctor's appointment you call them i've done this and then you want to you know you you're about 20 minutes away so you say I'm, you're like 18 minutes away gps says so yeah i'll be there in 15 because you're trying to minimize the damage that you're doing because you're you know you're the one that's late you know that you're the one causing the problem so you want to kind of minimize it but i'm telling you resist that urge if your gps says 18 minutes don't say 15, say, maybe say, say 20 or maybe even 25. I'd probably say 20 and then maybe just, you know, without being uh, unsafe, maybe hit the accelerator a little bit, but have the, have the, don't, don't do 15. Then you're really 17. I'm telling you it's because they don't really care. You're late. You're late. Whether you say you're 15 minutes late or 20 on one hand, they don't care, but they'll say, okay, 20. And then you show up at 15. Now you're, you're not a hero, but you've you've ingratiated yourself just a little tiny bit. So timing is a big one. You will get ahead so much by just having the right uh, by by following through on simple tasks on that specific time and date, and make sure people know it. <laughs> another one is, um, or, or it's not really another one. It's it's a continuation of it. Once you've if you, if a client asks you to do something, obviously I'm in the you know investment business, and oftentimes it's you know change an address, change a phone number, or you know can can we want to add an extra amount of money, or can we can you facilitate the withdrawal, and drop in our checking account, whatever it is. I uh, I always again, however the however I'm talking to them, 
Um, or even if it's, let's say it's an email. So let me, do, let me do it this way. Let's say it's an email. I'll reply back and say yes. And I either do it right away. And if I can't do it right away, I will reply right away because that only takes less than 10 seconds. I'll say, got it. I will do it uh, by today or I'll do it by tonight or I'll do it by tomorrow and I'll let you know. And whatever that time frame is, I do it sooner than that. If I say, uh, if I know I'll probably do it today, but it's going to be like in the evening, maybe even after hours, if it's something I can do after hours, and I'll quickly calculate, well, not quickly, I'm going to calculate it, and I'll, and I'll tell them I'll do it by tomorrow morning, and I'll actually do it tonight. If I, if I know I can't get to it today, but I'm going to do it probably tomorrow in the a.m., I'll tell them I'll do it after lunch. I'll get a time by, by after lunchtime or by afternoon. You see what I mean? So I don't exaggerate like super crazy, but I go a little bit more. Then I, I, then I do the thing during the time I expect it. And then you always follow up. Always follow up. Right? In fact, in my case, again, my industry, if it's something with account related, I'll take a screenshot of the whatever the thing was I had to fix, change, or, or facilitate transaction. I mean, they all get, in our industry, they get emails from, you know, this happened, that happened. But I'll still take a screenshot and send that to them. Say, okay, I got it done. So it's kind of like, I look at it like a three-piece sandwich, right? Or a three-piece, you know, the sandwich method. Right? Number one is I'm, I make sure they are very clear that I got the message. Whether it's face to face, on the phone, email, whatever, I'm acknowledging this thing. I'm acknowledging we have an appointment set up for next Thursday at three. I'm acknowledging you want me to check on, you know, a simple IRA for your brother's company. I, you know, you want me to go into your IRA and add money for last year. You want me to, you know, whatever it is. I'm acknowledging the thing. And then I'm giving you, it's part of the same one. This is step one. Right away, I'm giving you an estimation of when I'm going to do it. And that estimation is almost always a little bit longer than I really need. Not much longer, though. Okay, You, you can't exaggerate all this stuff. No, it's over-deliver, but it's not crazy over-deliver. Because people will catch on, too, by the way, if you always do it. Just like Scotty in Star Trek. But you do want to do a little bit more, right? Then that's the, the meat is you actually doing it. And that's another thing. Team. If you just actually do most of the stuff you say you're going to do, if not all, you are ahead of most people nowadays. It's frustrating on the receiving end, but being in the service business nowadays, like, it's like taking candy from a baby it, because almost everybody blows it. Like, how many times have you had someone that actually said they're going to do something to do and you're actually amazed? You even go tell your husband, your wife, your coworker, your friend, because it's so rare. Wow, he actually did it. Right? And then three, the, the final part of that sandwich is then you acknowledge it, right? You, If possible, you show some kind of demonstration of the thing that you did, but at minimum, just send the message it was done. It's so basic. Like you wouldn't even need to like read a book to know that that's what you're supposed to do. And most people don't. And you're far ahead by that if you just do that. Okay. Excuse me. So let's see. The other one was... Okay, the other one's kind of part of it is predictability. So this is not directly under promise over deliver, but it's kind of part of all the same. It's like in my case, in my example, in my business, we do a monthly newsletter that you got to sell, you do yourself, right? It's not like we buy a newsletter and you got to, you know, put it together. And I've been teaching my guys for honestly 25 years to do newsletters. And most don't. They don't do it consistently. It completely baffles me because it's so easy to do. And I mean, the first few times you do when it takes a while to put everything together. But once you've done it like seven months in a row, because it's monthly, it's you're on autopilot. I've been doing it for 25 years or longer. It's just, it doesn't take, I put on Netflix, put a movie on, get my laptop and I do it, take my time doing it, you know, and, and it's no big deal. And it's so powerful because here's here's the important part. And you might be able to apply this concept to something in your industry. And that is, I believe that for the most part, the content of the newsletter is the least important of the thing. Even though in my industry, the content's very important. It's the investment business, right? There's a lot of stuff going on, okay? 
but I'm I'm confident. I don't know for sure, and I, I you probably never know. But I but just from over doing this for many years, I feel that most clients probably don't actually read. They for sure don't read the whole newsletter, all the different elements of it. But they, I think many of them don't even click it open, or occasionally they'll open it. But they'll probably read the heading, which is important. I'm not going to go into newsletter technique, but they'll read the heading, and sometimes the heading alone is just enough for me to get a message across. But here's what it does. Number one, yes, there is meat and content in there. You hope that some clients read, and it helps them make an informed decision. It gives them some training, some education. Good. But we know most people aren't going to have the time. Do you read most of your newsletters? I don't even read many of the newsletters that I've voluntarily, proactively subscribed to on my own, let alone for my car insurance guy, right, or for my CPA or whatever. But number two, what it does is, again, like with that heading subject line, it'll sometimes just remind them of, like, it's like a quick training, right? Just them reading, don't listen to... Don't follow the news regarding investments. I mean, that's not the how I'd phrase it, but that's the message. Three, which is actually the most important, took me a long time to figure this out, and this is how it relates to today's topic, is it keeps you predictable. You do at the same time, you know, every month, it's the same newsletter format, same general idea, it looks the same, same time of the month, I'm saying it again, it's predictable, it's reliable, it's dependable, it keeps you top of mind to your client. You're a professional. Most of the time, happened to me just a couple days ago, when an existing client or a prospect who's on a newsletter wants to make a change, wants to get, wants to add money, wants to do something. It's almost, or at least more than half the time, it comes in response to an email. They say reply. It's like they had it on their mind. Oh, I've got to ask Michael because I want to finally get my college plan done for my two-year-old, whatever. They finally got a in mind. They're finally talking about it. And then they keep forgetting to call you, right? Because back what I said before, this is today's era, right? People don't write stuff down. They don't make lists. They don't make notes. You want to do that. But then what they do do is all of a sudden my email comes in beginning of the month, my newsletter, and they go, oh, yeah, that's right. So they just hit reply. They don't even read the thing. Hit reply. Because that was a trigger. This is all part of that predictability. Right? <laughs> when, you're, when you're with a client, you want to be the same guy or gal that you are were on the first visit. And, you know, two visits ago. You don't want to be changing everything too much. I don't know if, and not if you're doing that, but you want to make sure that you're consistent, predictable. <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. Okay, the other thing, just kind of in general, I'll just kind of close with this, is probably uh, is on the, it's probably more to do with the promise part. Um, I've, I think I've been talking mostly really about you delivering, right? A little bit about you promise, you know, promise you're going to do it by tomorrow and you do it tonight. But you want to be careful about not promising things that are exaggerated, like about the product. Um, one of the one thing that's really helped me is Tom Hopkins talked about this, which was bragging the objection. And I've used this philosophy where, contrary to some other sales training, for example, I don't ever hide the price of something. I don't. I don't. Uh, wait till the end. I don't try to elicit all the benefits first because if I'm talking with someone, a prospect, and if I was selling a car or a house or something else, I know that in their mind, they're right away thinking, what's this going to cost me? I know that. And, they're, and, and they'll keep on thinking that while you're telling them all the benefits, but you've been taught to wait for the end to talk about the price because you want to sell the benefits first. I, I, I don't believe in that. I believe those things, you're going to sell benefits. I tell them the price right away. Or if a product has a problem, if there's a major glaring issue with a particular product, let's take a variable annuity, um, has, you can't take it out to 59 and a half. If you take it out, not only that, in most cases, I'm not doing a, tra a training on variable annuities today, but most variable annuities, you have to wait seven years before you can take the money out without a penalty and be 59 and a half years old. So if I'm 
recommending a variable new to a client, I'll bring that up. I'm not saying it's the first sentence, but I'll bring it up right away. Very early on. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a couple of problems with variable annuities. Here's what I usually it's three things. I say there's three things. The most important one is the cost. You gotta pay for it. I'm gonna talk about some fantastic benefits and why I think this fit this fits your situation. And ultimately, I think it's my best advice to you. But I'm gonna tell you right now, fees, we'll get into it. Number two is you can't take the money out for seven years. I mean, you can, but if you do, there's a fee and you gotta be 59 and a half, whichever's longer. As an example, it's not about variable annuities. Okay, just the top of my head. So that's an example of of not so much over uh, under promising, but it's an example of not over promising. It is is I I don't hide the bad stuff, and I don't exaggerate the good stuff. I suppose is maybe the way I want to say that, and that's really helped me a lot. Is 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 not doing that is is getting the negatives out if they are negatives, and sometimes I go, oh, that's it. Oh, well, first of all, we don't plan on taking until 65. You know, we're 50 now. Well, let's talk about the fees as an example. Okay.